Thank you. Thank you. Love you too. Well, good evening, everybody. It's such a pleasure for me to be here and to be able to speak, uh, not only to the conference, but I know this is an open meeting here tonight, so welcome. I'm glad we're here. If I don't know you, met, I know you yet, I'd love to meet you, and uh, it's just a pleasure for me to be here. My wife asked me here this evening, uh, before I started, I said, David, do you have a joke or a funny story to begin with? I told her, I got nothing, babe. Let's get right into the text. So if you would, open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. As you're finding that passage, uh, let, me, uh, let me pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful. We're grateful, Lord, for so many things. But Lord, at the very top of the list is everything that you've given to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we ask, Lord, that tonight you would be very near to us and speak to us through your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand in a better way the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning here at verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Very obviously, the theme of our conference here together these days is the power of the gospel. And obviously, what struck my mind and my eyes in this text was the reference in verse 5, where Paul makes to this idea that our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. And so really, very basically and straightforward, that's what I want to talk to you tonight how the gospel comes in power, and what happens when the gospel comes in power, because I think Paul does a beautiful job in this first chapter of Thessalonians explaining that to us. But maybe just for a little bit of background, we need to understand Paul's coming to the church at Thessalonica. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul's on his second missionary tour, he's in the city of Philippi. And you remember what happened to Paul. He's in the Philippian jail. He's singing. God sends the earthquake. There's a miraculous freeing of the chains and opening of the prison cells or whatever way they were restrained there. And then we see that not only was Paul delivered from the prison, he and Silas, but also you had this phenomenon of the Philippian jailer being saved and this remarkable work going on in the city. But not long after that, Paul was forced out of the city of Philippi. After that, he went to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the prosperous capital of the province of Macedonia, found in northern Greece. And Thessalonica was situated on the famous Roman road known as the Ignatian Way. It was a 700-mile-long, 20-foot-wide, paved superhighway that went all the way from modern-day Istanbul to the Adriatic Sea. It was a remarkable road. Well, after only three weekends of prosperous ministry in Thessalonica, we find this in Acts chapter 17, Paul had to flee from an angry mob. And if you want to gauge of how effective Paul's work was, again, just over three Sabbath days that Paul was there in Thessalonica. If you want to gauge of how effective his work was there, it was there in Thessalonica that Paul's enemies said of him, he's turning the world upside down. Isn't that a marvelous thing to have your enemies say of you with the work of the gospel? You're turning the world upside down, which of course we would say he's turning it right side up. But from their perspective, it was upside down. That's in Acts chapter 17, verse 6. So from Thessalonica, Paul moved on to Berea. Again, he enjoyed several weeks of ministry there, but something remarkable happened there. The same angry mob that drove him out of the city of Thessalonica, 
They traveled 45 miles to Berea to drive him out of that city. That's a dedicated angry mob. <laughs> you know, today, angry mobs, they just do it with a few, you know, typing in a few angry tweets and this and that. That's a dedicated angry mob, and they drove Paul out of Thessalonica. Therefore, after that, he went to Athens, then he ended up in Corinth. And when Paul was in Corinth, a couple guys that he left behind in Thessalonica came and visited him. And those two guys were Timothy and Silas, or Silvanus, it's the same name. They came from Thessalonica to meet Paul in Corinth, and they came with tremendous news. This was the news. Paul, the church that you left in Thessalonica, it's going strong. Now, this was only a few months after Paul left them behind. So it's not like they had a track record of several years. But just in the few months, uh, Silas and Timothy could report to Paul, there is something really good happening in the church at Thessalonica. Paul was so excited about it that he said, you know what, I'm going to write a letter to those guys. And the best evidence we have tells us that this letter of 1 Thessalonians was the first letter we have of anything that Paul wrote to the churches. It came from this encouraging report that he made, or that he received, rather, from Silas and Timothy. But that's not all the visit of Silas and Timothy did. Let me read you from Acts chapter 18, verse 5. It says this. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, that is Thessalonica, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, Paul was already working in Corinth preaching the gospel, doing what he could. But when he had that visit from Paul and Silas, who had just come from Thessalonica, telling him the magnificent work that God was doing there, it's as if it charged up Paul all over again. And he said, man, if God is doing such a great work in Thessalonica, maybe he can do a great work here in Corinth. And he got all the more busy about his work. So knowing that the power of the gospel was still at work among the Thessalonians made Paul more excited about his work right there in the city of Corinth. Now with that kind of background, I just want to walk you through these verses and show you how it shows us how the gospel came in power to the Christians of Thessalonica. And of course, it'll speak to us today. Look now at verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. By the way, you can just see how grateful Paul was for the Thessalonians. God's doing such a wonderful work in you all. I, I am so grateful for it that they prayed for them. And I love that phrase, making mention of you in our prayers. First of all, it shows that you don't have to enter into intercessory prayer for somebody for an hour for it to be effective. Are there people that you just make mention of in prayer? I hope so. You can put me down on that prayer list for making mention of prayer if you want. Just make mention, Lord bless Pastor David and the work that he does with Enduring Word, whatever you want to say. But Paul said, no, I'm making mention of you in prayer. And he said, we're doing it together. Did you see that phrasing in verse 2? Making mention of you in our prayers. When they got together and prayed, they made mention of what God was doing there among the Thessalonians. Now, notice this, verses 3 and 4, he continues. Remembering, without ceasing, your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sight of God our Father, God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Pa Paul's fleshing out the idea of why he's grateful. He's not just grateful that the Thessalonians exist, but that God was doing a real work among them. The gospel was, being working, was working in them in power, and this is how it was manifest. Notice, first of all, your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. Faith, hope, love. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Paul notices it there among the Thessalonians. And then he says, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father. Now look, I find this to be remarkable. Paul was so grateful for God's work among the Thessalonians. But notice this. Paul's gratitude did not come because the Christians in Thessalonica thought really highly of him. You know, sometimes we're only grateful for people if they think highly of us. But if you do a close study of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
when Paul has to answer a lot of accusations about his character, it seems evident that at least some among the Thessalonian Christians didn't have a very high opinion of Paul, and he had to do just a little bit of defending of his character. That's remarkable. Paul still thought highly of them, even though they didn't think too highly, or at least all of them didn't think too highly of him. Secondly, Paul's gratitude didn't come because the Thessalonian Christians were morally impeccable. Later on in chapter 4, Paul has to give them strong and direct warnings against sexual immorality. In other words, this was a problem. When Silas and Timothy came to Paul, not only did they bring good news, but they also said, Paul, there's a little bit of trouble that you need to address here in the church at Thessalonica. People are speaking poorly of you. And Paul said, okay, great, I'll address that in my letter. People are going off into sexual immorality. And Paul said, great, I'll address that in my letter. And then the third thing is, Paul's gratitude didn't come because the Thessalonian Christians were completely accurate in all of their doctrine. Chapters 4 and 5, he has to correct some doctrinal problems that they had. Now, I just want to say, when I saw this and understood that this was a bit of a revelation to me that I was very impressed by. Just by this simple idea that the Thessalonian Christians weren't perfect, but God's work in them through the power of the gospel was real. Sometimes we have a pretty high threshold for what we'll accept as a mark that God is really doing a work in somebody. And you know what? Paul would probably say if you were to interview them, him about the Thessalonians, he would say, look, God's work by the power of the gospel in them, it has only begun, but it has really begun, and I'm going to be grateful for that. Brothers and sisters, I think this is a big point. We can be happy about God's work in someone's life, even when we still see that there's lots of work to be done. Don't be shy about it. Be grateful and happy about God's work in somebody's life through the power of the gospel. Paul was, even though there was still a lot of work to do. Then at the end of verse 4, he makes this interesting reference. He says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. I think it's interesting how he calls them beloved brethren. Of course, Paul could be referring to his love for them because he did love them. But I I think, I don't know if I can prove it, but I think Paul might be referring here to God's love for them as well. Because I know this, the concept of God's love and the concept of God's election go together. It's very natural that you choose the people you love. And there's also a sense in which you love the people you choose. Paul combined both ideas here. Now, This brings us to the verse that I really want to focus on. It's verse 5, because I think this is a remarkable statement describing the power of the gospel. Notice this here. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. There's a lot for us to unpack there, but I think it begins just with those first three words. I love those first three words. Did you notice them? For our gospel. Now, please understand this. This wasn't Paul's gospel or our gospel. He's talking about himself and Silas and Timothy. It wasn't Paul's gospel in the sense that he made it. No, it wasn't his creation. It wasn't his invention. He didn't compose the music of the gospel. God composed it. It's God's gospel in that sense. But it was Paul's gospel in the sense that it was his gospel that he had taken unto himself for salvation in Jesus Christ. It was his gospel. And listen, brothers, sisters, this is a very, very simple point. It has to be your gospel, doesn't it? Again, I'm not trying to apply for a moment that it's your invention. It's your composition. No, never. We don't create it. We don't invent it. But we must receive it. We must lay hold of it. And it must lay hold of us. And in that sense, it's our gospel. And my earnest hope is that each and every person here this evening, whether whether you're, you're watching us live here, in the sanctuary, or or whether you're watching this later in some kind of video, or live through the live stream, listen, 
brothers and sisters, I hope that it is your gospel that you can say, I have laid hold of it and it has laid hold of me. So Paul says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. You you see what that says? That the gospel, at least the, the true gospel, it is not a matter of mere words. In modern culture, there is an overflow of information, of uh, entertainment. Oftentimes, that information and entertainment amounts to mere words. Yet the gospel is more than words. It has power. Now, maybe I should back up just for a little bit and say, what is the gospel? What is it? We say gospel, gospel, gospel. Do we really even know what it is? And when it comes to defining the gospel today, we're probably dealing with a somewhat diluted term in our day and age, or at least among Christians. Now, I am very grateful that in many circles over the last decade or so, there's been a renewed emphasis on the gospel. Yet I would say there is an unintended downside on the emphasis on the gospel that we've had in the last 10 or 15 years. Because today, gospel is often used as an adjective. The word gospel is used to describe something else. What do I mean by that? Well, you could search around on the internet. Please don't do it now, even though you have your phone. You could search around on the internet and and find gospel ministry, gospel parenting, gospel marriages, gospel church government, Gospel reconciliation, gospel masculinity, gospel femininity, gospel contextualization, gospel growth, gospel arts, on and on and on. Now again, I think I get what people mean by this, but it seems today that people use the word gospel in place of the way that a previous generation might use the word biblical. We're just trying to try to describe things that are true according to the word of God and according to his counsel. I'm just saying... Just putting the word gospel in front of something, it may not help us understand it any better today. So what is the gospel? Well, I give you the definition that that I've kind of worked with myself. And I don't know how much of this I've borrowed from somebody else and how much I've just, because I don't think there's anything terribly unique in what, I hope there's nothing unique in my definition of the gospel. But here's how I would word it. The gospel is the message the good news of what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially what he accomplished in his crucifixion and resurrection. That's how I would define the gospel. It's a message. It's good news of something God did. The gospel is not about what we must do. It's about what God has done. And what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ. But you need to narrow it down at least a little bit. A little bit, Especially what God did in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here's how the apostle Paul phrased it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Keep a finger here in 1 Thessalonians Turn back a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. I want you to read these passages, this passage, these verses from your own Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to read you verses 1 through 4. As you're finding that in your Bible, I just want to see if I can make a connection here. When Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, he wrote it from Corinth. And here in 1 Corinthians which was written three or four years later after 1 Thessalonians, he described the gospel that he preached when he first came to Corinth. So I understand that 1 Corinthians was written three or four years after 1 Thessalonians, but since he's describing the gospel he preached when he first came, what he's describing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is of the same era of the time that he's writing 1 Thessalonians. So here's what he wrote. This is Paul's definition. Could I be so bold to say it's God's definition of the gospel? Right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declared to you 
the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Okay, now he's going to get to the actual stating of the content of the gospel. Ready for this? For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now in the following verses, Paul continues on the theme of resurrection, giving many proofs for the resurrection of Jesus. But that's basically the gospel right there. What did Paul say the gospel was? It's the message of what God did according to the scriptures in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in my mind, that's the most proper definition of the gospel. What God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially what he accomplished in his crucifixion and resurrection. If you're not preaching that, you're not preaching the gospel. You're preaching something else. Now, since I said it's what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ, if you wanted to draw back the camera a little bit and get a bigger picture of the idea, you could consider in the larger sense other aspects of the person and work of Jesus Christ. You could consider his sinless life. You could consider his training of the disciples. You could consider his teaching ministry that was without parallel uh, in all of history. You, you could consider his radical identification with lost humanity throughout his entire message. But this is what I want you to understand. All those other aspects fall short if they don't also point towards the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. To preach the sinless life of Jesus Christ is not preaching the gospel unless you bring it to the place where you point out it's because he lived a sinless life that he could be the sinless sacrifice for sins. To preach the training of the apostles or the disciples is not enough unless you bring to the place where you explain that they could have never done what they did without the work of Jesus in his crucifixion and resurrection on their behalf. So again, these are things that we must present. And you know what I think is wonderful about this? It tells us that if it's true that the message of the gospel really is the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what that says about the gospel? It says that the gospel is rooted in historical events. Those aren't ideas. Those aren't theories. Those aren't philosophies. Those are about things that really happened in space and time, that at a real plot of ground, in a real place, right outside the city walls of Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And that message is the message of the gospel. As I said before, the gospel is not a theory. The gospel is not a philosophy. It's not good advice. It's not an opinion. The gospel is a fact. This is what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's a fact to be believed, a fact to be proclaimed, and it's a fact to be received. It's not to be created or edited and certainly not improved upon. That is the message of the gospel. Now, <laughs> praise the Lord. Before I talk about the power of the gospel, there's a couple other points that I'd like to make just because I believe they're important. First of all, the focus of the gospel is always what Jesus has done, not what we must do. And brothers and sisters, really, this is the entire difference between a me-centered Christianity and a Jesus-centered Christianity. Look, I, I have no inside knowledge. Uh, nobody's informed on me about you. But, but surely there are some people here this evening, basically you're living a me-centered Christianity. And it's a struggle and it's a drag. A Jesus-centered Christianity is a real fruit of the gospel. That's the one thing. The second thing that I always like to add as well when I'm talking about the gospel is to say this, that to faithfully preach the gospel, you also have to preach the love of God. Why? Why? 
because that was the whole motive for what Jesus accomplished on the cross in the empty tomb. You, you can't preach it properly without preaching the motive. And if only there was a verse somewhere that explained to us God's motive for all of that. If only there was a verse somewhere that said something like this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Really, I mean, that's it, isn't it? So yes, to faithfully preach the gospel is to present the historical facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but it's to do it with also preaching the motive of the cross, and that is the love of God for lost and perishing humanity. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, that message has power. I know the world doesn't think so. The world will mock it. The world will underestimate it. They'll wonder how the death of a Galilean carpenter 2,000 years ago makes any difference or relevance today. But we know, don't we? We know. For those of us who have received and encountered and seen the power of the gospel in action, we know. That's why Paul can say, now back to verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He said, the gospel came also in power. There was a real change of life. And in the Holy Spirit, there was something really happening by the Holy Spirit of God in the ministry of Paul as he preached the gospel. And I love this phrase in verse 5. It was in much assurance. There was something certain and real about this work of God's power and the Holy Spirit. It was evident in the Thessalonians. That's why Paul says, I see your work of faith, your labor of love. That's why I see your patience of hope. By the way, the word for patience there is that great Greek word, hupomone, which really means like perseverance, endurance. It's a wonderful word. Your endurance and perseverance of hope. That was brought in to the life of the Thessalonian believers because of the power of the gospel. And it continued on. In verse 6, he talks about them being followers of us and the Lord. That happened by the power of the gospel. They followed in much affliction in verse uh, 6. In verse 6, also talks about them being filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. All of that comes from the power of the gospel. Now, I do want to point out that the changed life is evidence of the power of the gospel, but it is not the gospel itself. Let me clarify something, and I hope you understand this. I do agree that there is tremendous power, there's tremendous effectiveness in us sharing our testimony, sharing the evidence of the power of the gospel in life. There's tremendous power in that, but I do want to tell you, your changed life is not the gospel. What Jesus did is the gospel. Your changed life is evidence of the power of the gospel, but it is not the gospel itself. Again, what is the gospel? It's what God has accomplished in the person and work of Jesus Christ, most especially in his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, we are in the midst of a pastor's conference here. And I know that this is an open meeting and so that there are many more people here this evening other than just who are part of the conference. But I hope you'll excuse me if I speak most directly to pastors and those who are serving the Lord here. Because I think that this passage has something important to say to them or maybe I should say to us about that. I want you to see how the power of the gospel was evident in Paul's ministry. We saw how it was evident in the Thessalonians. Praise the Lord for that. How was it evident in Paul's ministry? Notice, first of all, it was evident in a message that was more than words. Verse 5 says, our gospel came to you not in word only. Isn't it true, fellow servants of God? What we preach has to be more than words. Lord, we pray that you would be uh, a kind enough, gracious enough to us to take what we preach and, and what Paul called the foolishness of preaching and make it something great beyond our capability because it has to be more than words. And you know what? It is not in my power to make it more than words. I, I can't yell louder. Oh, look, sometimes I get excited, and I do kind of yell from here, I admit. But, but, but my, my louder talk, it's not going to make it more powerful. I can pound on the pulpit. That's not going to make it more powerful. 
I can use great gestures or theatrics. That's not going to make it more powerful. Brethren, sisters, this is something that the Holy Spirit of God does, and we need to pray for an outpouring of God's power to be fulfilled through the gospel. I'll talk more about that later. That's connected to what he says in verse 5. It's also evident in the Holy Spirit. What we preach must be blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe, brothers and sisters, in all my heart, in the power of the exposition of God's word. I mean, I've seen it. This is, this is my life's work. To, to exposit, to explain the word of God. But my prayer is, any time that I would have the opportunity to talk to people about God's word or write about God's word, that it would be, well, well what I've heard Pastor Brian speak on another occasion. I love this phrase he used. He called it anointed exposition. And that's what we're looking for. There, there is such a thing as a dry, technical handling of the text that almost seems divorced from the power and the presence of God. We don't want that. And I agree, God can use his word in any kind of crazy circumstance. We believe that. But how much more if the one who is presenting God's word says, no, I want it to be a place where the Holy Spirit is active and working. That was true of Paul's ministry. We want it to be true of ours. Next, number three, it was evident, verse five, with much assurance. Did you see that phrase in verse five? With much assurance. With the Holy Spirit and much assurance. And all I'll say about that is we should preach and teach the Bible with much, much assurance. This is true. Preach it as someone who believes it. Teach it as someone who believes it. And um, look, if you're having trouble with believing it, you can borrow some of my belief because I believe this book to be true. <laughs> preach it with much assurance. But then number four I want to look at here I think is very, very important. It's also evident in lives of integrity. Look at the phrase at the end of verse 5. He says this, And you knew what kind of men we were among you. Paul could say, you want to know how our gospel came in power? Look at us. Our lives were changed. Brothers, pastors, we need to preach as people who have been touched by the transforming power of the gospel ourselves. Are you, letting the, are you letting the power of the gospel speak to you? Is there evidence in your life of transformation? Can, can you really say to people, look at my life, obviously not as an example of sinless perfection. No, no, there's going to be plenty of failure, plenty of sin. We all sin and fall short. But listen, this is what we know, that if we can't be examples to our people of perfection, then at least we can be examples to them of humble repentance. And, and when we sin, we'll set it right. But no, it has to be real. We need to be in the same place Paul could say where he could stand in front of his people metaphorically. He wrote this in a letter. But I picture Paul metaphorically standing in front of the Thessalonians and saying to them, you know what kind of man I was among you. He's not saying it boastfully. He's not saying it arrogantly. But with all this, I say, you saw my life. You saw that it was real in my life. And because you saw it was real in my life, it gave you hope that it could be powerful and real in your life. That's what we need to have. It was true among the Thessalonians. And then one more thing here before I move on to my conclusion. I would make a fifth point. One specific way that it was evident in Paul's life was that he lived an others-centered life of love. Look at verse 5 again. What does he say? He says... As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Oh, that's really it, isn't it? That speaks to the sacrificial attitude that a shepherd should have for the sheep. I'm not doing it for my sake. I'm not diligent as a pastor so that I can gain more. So that I can be more. So that I can be lifted up. No, it is for the sake of God's glory and for the sake of his people. And Paul could appeal to them. He could say, you know I did it for your sake, 
what a beautiful thing there was about true sincerity, sacrificial love in Paul's ministry. They could say, you know I did this for your sake. I, I fear some of us, if we were to say that before our congregations, there might just be a muffled laugh in the congregation. Pastor, have I really seen that? Have I really seen that you do it for our sakes and for the Lord's, of course? But it's evident that you're not doing it for your sake. Well, may we always be able to project that to our people. But I just want you to see this beautiful interrelation. The gospel was evident in power among the Thessalonians because it was first evident in power in the life of Paul and those who ministered with him. And that's always the pattern. Isn't it true? You can't give what you haven't first received. And that's why our constant prayer needs to be, Lord, work on me. If I am your preacher, if I am your servant, then work on me first. Transform me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Hone my life in the way that it needs to be honed. All right, now, I want to conclude with a question. And it'll take me a few minutes to develop this, so don't get your hopes up. I've got a few more minutes here. Here's the question. How would my life and ministry be different if I truly trusted in the power of the gospel? And here's some suggestions. Number one, if I truly trusted in the power of the gospel, it would have a wonderful effect on my daily walk with Jesus. I would actually lay hold of all that is bound up for me in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially what he accomplished in his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, when we think of what Jesus accomplished for us in his crucifixion and resurrection, we tend to think of that only in terms of forgiveness of sins. That's been the emphasis in the Western world for many hundreds of years. And that's true that what Jesus accomplished at the cross was the forgiveness of the sins of all those who will put their trust in him. And we praise God for it. But I want you to remind, be reminded of this, that there are many dimensions to what Jesus accomplished on the cross that go beyond the forgiveness of sins. Last year at this very conference, Dr. Brashears gave a wonderful uh, uh, lecture or, 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 or sermon uh, to the conference where he talked about the dimensions of Jesus's work on the cross beyond just what we would normally consider the forgiveness of sins. And I got to say, I was quite taken with what he taught there. And, and really, my mind's been thinking about it very actively for the past year. And, and we just need to consider that what Jesus did in his crucifixion and his resurrection it, it takes us, well, it takes us from shame to honor. Jesus lifts us to honor. It takes us from fear to power. Jesus is our protector. It takes us from defiled to clean. Jesus cleanses us and restores us. It takes us from lost to belonging. Jesus rescues us. It takes us from chaos to order. Jesus brings order to our life. It takes us from despair to hope. Jesus brings hope to us. It takes us from slavery to freedom. Jesus sets us free. It takes us from death to life. Jesus brings life. And of course, it takes us from guilty to innocent. Jesus brings forgiveness. But brothers and sisters... If you think of Jesus' work on the cross in only one dimension of the forgiveness of sins, then you can say, well, I am forgiven. What more is there of the gospel for me? No. If we're talking about all the dimensions of what Jesus did for on the cross, this is something for us to live in and walk in every day of our Christian experience. It's for you. It's for us. Now, the second thing I think would be different in my life if I really believed in the power of the gospel is I would, well, let me put it this way, with a focus on the power of the gospel, instead of the power of me, I would get beyond a try-harder Christian message. 
Look, I, I want to make an apology to you on behalf of pastors and preachers everywhere. Sometimes we slip into the bad habit of, of making all of our messages kind of blend together into this one thing. And the basic message is this. Try harder in your Christian life. Right now, go home. You try harder. Try harder now. Let me tell you, there is not much nourishment in the soul in that message, try harder. Now, I will say this. There is a time and a place for that message in the Christian life. We see exhortations like that, similar to that. Paul telling early Christians to put their, their effort, their, their energy in a certain direction. There is a place, so to speak, for that message. Try harder, But that is never the dominant message of the Christian life. Instead of being the dominant message is try harder, what's the dominant message? It's Jesus has done it for you. He accomplished it in his work at the crucifixion and resurrection. So on behalf of pastors everywhere, I apologize when we've slipped into that bad habit. And I just want to say, we need to understand for ourselves, and the, the key to the Christian life is not looking at myself and saying, try harder. It's looking to Jesus himself and living life in and through him. Here's another thing I think I would do differently if, if. I really trusted in the power of the gospel. I think I'd give more evangelistic invitations. I mean, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul explained how he boldly proclaimed the gospel. Look at chapter 2, verse 2 in 1 Thessalonians. He says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Certainly one reason Paul was bold about the gospel was because he was confident in the power of the gospel. And look, I really believe it's up to each individual pastor how God might want them to give an invitation. There's all different ways to do it. And listen, there are bad ways to invite people to make a decision for Jesus Christ, and there's good ways. Here's what I want to tell you about the bad ways. Don't do them. <laughs> but the good ways of simply calling people to decide and put their trust in Jesus Christ, in what he did at the cross and the empty tomb for them, that's good. And sometimes we just need to be a little more confident and more often give those invitations however God might lead us to do it. Because look, let's face it. Why is it that I often, not always, not always, but why is it that often I don't give an invitation? I don't think anybody's going to respond. And somehow maybe it'll look like the gospel's powerless. Or worse yet, I'll look like I'm a failure. Oh, find me my fainting couch. Nobody came forward. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if nobody responds, so what? We put it out there. God does his work, and we leave it to him. So I, obviously, we make no law about this, but I just say, if you believe in the power of the gospel, ask God, Lord, should I be doing more evangelistic invitations to reflect my confidence in the power of the gospel? And then, fourthly, my hope and my trust would not be in methods or programs or in personality. My hope and my trust would be more and more in the power of the gospel. That's what it would be like if I really trusted in the power of the gospel. Now, believe me, it's not that I don't think that God can use methods. Of course he does. I love reading about what God has done in years past. A book I've been reading recently is a great little book by the late Dr. J. Edwin Orr that we've actually just republished. It's called The Second Great Evangelical Awakening, or The Second Evangelical Awakening, actually. And in it, he describes a great work of God in America in 1857-58 and in Great Britain in 1859 and 60. And in one of those, he tells all these amazing stories during that time of revival. One of my favorites is he talks about uh, the work of revival in Manchester, England. And Christians in Manchester decided that they were going to distribute printed invitations to a gospel tea meeting. And they went out and they distributed them in the worst places in the slums of Manchester. They went to the brothels. They went to the opium dens. They went to the gambling parlors. They went to the grog shops. They went to it all. They distributed these invitations. And on the invitation, it specifically said that only thieves would be admitted to this tea meeting. 
300 admitted thieves showed up and a bunch of them got saved when they preached the gospel to them. I, I just, you know. Now you say, is that a method? Yeah, it's a crazy method and God used it. So we understand God can use methods, but our hope and our trust is never in programs, methods, or personalities. It's in the power of the gospel. I mean, we look around this room. We, we look at things like video projectors and microphones. I thank God for technology like this. It makes my job of preaching a lot easier. You think I'm shouting now? You should see if I had to fill this whole room without a microphone. But listen, my trust isn't in the microphone. My trust isn't in the video projector. My trust isn't in the lighting or any of the other accoutrements. Very consciously, I look around and say, okay, Lord, thank you for the lighting. My trust isn't in that. Thank you for the comfortable seats. My trust isn't in that. Thank you for the microphone. My trust isn't in that. So it's not that we're against using methods, but we decidedly say we are not going to put our trust in those. We're going to put our trust in the power of the gospel. And then finally, I think if we really believed in the power of the gospel, it would make us more dependent upon prayer. I mean, after all, we believe that God has promised that the gospel, the message of the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially in what he has accomplished in the crucifixion and resurrection, God said that that message would have power. But please understand, brothers and sisters, like so many of the promises of God, he hasn't given us these promises to be fatalistic. In other words, God promised the gospel without power, so whatever. No, God gives us promises so that we will by faith lay hold of them in prayer and say to God, as if we were holding his word up to him in heaven, God, you promised that your word would have power. You promised that the message of the gospel would have power. Would you fulfill it so among us here and now? It should embolden our prayers. It should deepen our prayers. It should make our prayers more numerous because we believe in the power of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, God has given us such a wonderful message to preach. May we do it preaching truly the gospel and seeing the power of the gospel at work. And you know where it should begin? In the life of the person who's sitting in your seat. Not the seat next to you. Yeah, Lord, do a work in them. Okay, Lord does need to do a work in them. But how about if he does it in the life of the person sitting in your seat so that the work of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel in every dimension would be real among us and in our congregations. I'm going to pray a prayer. And as I pray this prayer, Pastor Wayne Taylor and Pastor Ray Bentley are going to come up. And they're going to lead us in some time of just directed seeking the Lord. I pray that you'll take it to heart. I pray this isn't one of these messages that, well, Lord, great. I hope they heard it or whatever. This needs to be us here tonight. Lord, what dimension of your work on the cross do you need to make real in my life? Father in heaven, we collectively thank you here this evening for the power of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that this is not an empty message. It is not mere words, but that these things aren't just things that happened 2,000 years ago, but it was you working in space and time in your plan of the ages to bring things together that you planned from before the foundation of the world. Because your word says that he's the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. Lord, you fulfilled that at the cross. And that's the gospel that we preach. But Lord, we need you to take that great work that you started from eternity past. And we need you to bring it down to where we are right here, right now, today. Would you please do it in our midst? We open our hearts, our lives wide open to the work of your Holy Spirit to do that. We pray this. In the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen.